Hi, I'm Michelle Shepard, host of Uncover Charmini from CBC Podcasts. In 1999, 15-year-old Charmini Anandavale disappeared on her way to a job that police believed didn't exist. Four months later, her remains were found in a wooded ravine. I revisit the case that has stayed with me for over 20 years, ever since I first covered it as a cub crime reporter for the Toronto Star. You can find Uncover Charmini on CBC Listen or on your favourite podcast app. This is a CBC Podcast. Dante, Sego, Anin, Bujou, and welcome. I'm Rosanna Deerchild. I'm Phelan Johnson. And this is Unreserved. Well, this is the seventh season of Unreserved, and the first time that I won't be sitting in the host chair. That's right. I'm heading off for the year to work on a different CBC project that we'll talk about in just a few minutes. And that's why Phelan's here. She's going to be taking over the show this season, so we're going to take some time to get to know each other a little bit better. And you're going to show me the ropes and share some of your favorite moments from the last six years of hosting the show. I bet it was hard to pick. So hard to pick, you know, going over the six years that we've been. We've been a team and putting this show together. We've met so many people. We've been to so many nations and places. It was, it was almost impossible, really. But, but uh, I got a few great memories to share today. Oh, sorry, Rosanna. I'm I'm hearing from headquarters that we've got a transmission coming in. Please, uh, can you just stand by for a minute and, and we'll see who it is. Okay, okay, great. Hailing Captain Deerchild. Hailing Captain Rosanna Deerchild of the Starship Unreserved. This is Jesse Wenthe of the planet Anishinaabe. I understand, Captain, that you have a new mission on a new ship. A mission that will take you through the stories of the past from a new perspective and help us better understand our future. This is a good mission for you and for all of us, and you are the right captain to take us there. I also understand that the Unreserved will be gaining a new captain. We look forward to their mission and supporting them as we have you. I trust they are as familiar with the Prime Directive as you are. Migwitch, Captain Deerchild, for all that you have accomplished on the Starship Unreserved, and I wish you a safe and successful journey. As our Vulcan cousins often say, live long and prosper. Wenty out. <laughs> you guys, you snuck up on me, yo! <laughs> I did not expect that. <laughs> Crazy. So that, that was, of course, one of Unreserved's very first columnist, Jesse Wente. Uh, we'll have more well-wishers dropping in throughout the show today to surprise you. Oh, get out. I'm so surprised. You're going to have me crying. But I look forward to hearing from more people. Thank you. Oh, gosh, I've got the feels already. <laughs> uh, so, Phelan... First of all, congratulations on um, becoming the new host. I'm sure it's going to be a great season. You're going to have a great time. Thank you, Rosanna. I'm I'm so excited to be here. So let's get to know you a little bit better. Where are you from? I'm from Six Nations of the Grand River Territory in southern Ontario. I'm Mohawk and Tuscarora. I'm Bear Clan. Um, actually, you know, one of my favorite episodes was the episode of Unreserved uh, where you went to Six Nations. I mean, I, I'm probably a bit biased about that, but, you know, in my humble opinion. It was a great time up in Six Nay, as the local cousins call it. Uh, and that's fair. You know, can you tell me a little bit more about um, growing up in Six Nations? Yeah, I, I loved growing up on Six Nations. Um, my cousins and my siblings, we all grew up very close, and it was a time before before there was cable or internet or any of that stuff. So we played outside all the time. And, you know, I think that's where my love of storytelling really comes from. Uh, we had to make our own fun and our own worlds. And so it was kind of a, a magical time for me growing up. I always think of it as like an indigenous Norman Rockwell painting. <laughs> 
It was that would be an interesting painting to see. <laughs> <You> know, yeah, <laughs> some click in the corner and some bannock in there. Yeah, right. Some t- some tea, some uh, condensed milk, <laughs> <For sure. laughs> a deer hanging, <laughs> a deer hanging in the garage. <laughs> anyway, so um, CBC podcast fans might recognize your voice and and your personality as one of the hosts of the Secret Life of Canada. Tell us a little bit about that podcast. Yes, so I co-host a podcast right here on CBC with my good friend Leah Simone Bowen. Uh, We are currently in our third season and the show looks at things that may have been left out of your high school history textbook. You know, we look at Indigenous stories, we look at Black and Brown and queer stories and women's stories, you know, all the things we need to hear more about and all the things that are, you know, left out all too often. So we, we aren't historians. We like to put that out there. We're just, you know, really curious about history. So we try to make the podcast approachable by mixing in humor and lots of pop culture references. Yes, that's awesome. I've heard it. It's a very cool podcast. Um, And you have a background in theater, is that right? Yes, it is. (laughs) So I'm a drama nerd (laughs) and a history nerd. (laughs) That's an awesome combination. (laughs) (laughs) I played trumpet in high school band as well. I was first chair. (laughs) And I promise unreserved listeners, uh, it won't won't just be a -a nerd-a-thon. It just might be 50% nerd-a-thon. But yes, <laughs> to get back to your question, I trained I trained as an actor. Um, and then I sort of transitioned into playwriting and then podcasting. And well, now I'm here. Mm-hmm. You're seeped in the story. What kinds of stories are you interested in uh, sharing this season on Unreserved? We are in such an interesting time right now. There's a, a global pandemic. And there's there's just a lot of unrest in the world as well. But I think our people have been through this before. Um, times like this. And so I want to look at the history of, you know, Indigenous people across this land and beyond and celebrate, you know, how we have gone forward and how we will continue to go forward. So much of who we are as a people, I think, is about connection and community. And I'm curious about what that looks like now in this moment. And so I want to share those stories. And I want to look at how Indigenous people are innovating and how they're thriving in this time. Absolutely. And that is a lot of story in there in itself. Um, and I'm very excited to listen to to the stories that you're going to bring this season, Phelan. Thank you, Rosanna. And I have to say, it is my extreme pleasure to sit behind your mic for this season. Oh, well, thank you. I'm Phelan Johnson. This is Unreserved on CBC Radio 1, Sirius XM 169 and Native Voice 1. With me is Rosanna Deerchild, sharing some of her favorite moments on the show over the last six seasons. We're going to find out more about your new project, Rosanna, but first, I want you to take a listen to this. Cousin, where are you going? What are you going to do? Can I come? Hey, wherever you're going, I'm really happy for you. I look forward to whatever you're going to do next. So appreciated what you've done so far. And um, best of luck. Just carry on. Carry on strong, because see you later. Oh, my God, girl. Of course you can come. Get in the canoe tent, too. Ah, ah. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> that was legendary actor Tantu Cardinal sending well wishes your way, Rosanna. Aw. <laughs> I'm having moments. I know no one can see your face. I have the luxury of seeing Rosanna's face right now, and I'd just like to tell everyone she's very moved. <laughs> There's a tear. I think I see a tear. <laughs> it's all happening right here on Unreserved Radio Indigenous. <laughs> and I know a lot of our listeners want to know more about what you'll be doing this season, Rosanna. You're working on a very exciting new project, a podcast with CBC Books based on the graphic novel anthology, This Place, 150 Years Retold. So for people who aren't familiar with the graphic novel, This Place, what can you tell us about it? Well, the graphic novel came out last year. It's a a young person's, a young adult uh, graphic novel. Um, It has stories from 11 Indigenous writers and is illustrated by... 10 Indigenous artists. Uh, These are stories that span 150 years of Canadian history, but the history 
from indigenous people. So these are stories that um, we as indigenous people have been telling in our communities around our around our campfires, possibly handed from family member to family member. So these are stories that maybe we'd be familiar with, but Canadians don't know. And there's real hunger for these stories and for the knowledge that they have. Um, people are asking, why didn't I know this before? I, I need to know this. And um, they're just really good stories. They're, they're creative and imaginative, and, and you know, you'll get lost in them for sure. And so what drew you to working on this project? You know, knowing that you would step away for this show from a season seems like, you know, that is something. What was so compelling about this project that you just had to do it? Yeah, you know, Unreserved is really important to me and is near and dear to my heart and, and remains so, of course. But uh, knowing that that space is still going to be held by yourself and, and the team will still be behind you telling these amazing stories and, and continuing that Indigenous radio space. Um, I felt as an Indigenous story myself that it was my responsibility to create more space, to tell more stories, to let more Indigenous storytellers in. And I feel like the CBC has a responsibility to do that as, as our national broadcaster. Um, so I feel like this was an ideal space to do it in. And it's a very exciting opportunity. And I just can't even wait to get started. And so when will the podcast launch? We hope to uh, that it'll be ready for, for podcast listeners in uh, sometime in like spring of 2021. And then later on for our, our radio listeners. So your favorite cousin will be back on the air. Don't you worry. Great. <laughs> You know her best as the host of this show. Rosanna Deerchild is an author, a poet, and the host of a new CBC podcast based on the novel, This Place, 150 Years Retold. Rosanna, this is your brother from another mother, Wabgijik Rice. I want to wish you all the best on your new podcast. You will rock it just like everything else that you do. You will be missed, however, on Unreserved. You are like a cousin, like an auntie, a great matriarch to many of us right across Turtle Island, a comforting voice and a powerful presence on the radio week in and week out. But we will very much look forward to you taking a deeper look at this place in podcast form. So again, congratulations. Much love and respect to you always. And and I can't wait to see you once again. Take care. Aww. Wub. <laughs> that was Wabgijik Rice, author of Moon of the Crusted Snow. Rosanna, what is it like for you to hear all of these messages? Oh, it's crazy. I didn't even expect it. Ugh. I should have expected. I mean, we've done sort of similar shows. We snuck up on, snuck up some audio behind people and been like, bam, have feelings. So I guess, you know, turnabout's fair play. <laughs> yes, yes, it is. It's wonderful to hear these messages. So wonderful. Thank you. This is Unreserved on CBC Radio 1, Sirius XM 169, and Native Voice 1. I'm Phelan Johnson, incoming host for Unreserved. With me today to teach me the ropes is your favorite cousin, Rosanna Deerchild. So, Rosanna, the listeners obviously know you as the host of this show. But you are also a poet, and both of these things aligned back in May of 2016 and created a very powerful moment on Unreserved. You spoke about an experience with your mom that inspired your book, Calling Down the Sky. What do you remember about the piece with your mom that aired on the show? Well, I remember it was very difficult, and part of um, hosting this show is not just, you know, sharing Indigenous story, but also sharing a lot of yourself. Um, even if that sometimes is uncomfortable or um, sad. So my mom is a residential school. She went to four residential schools. Um, the book is about her experience there. And so we turned it into this beautiful audio piece where I was able to share what it was like to, to grow up as a, you know, a, a residential school survivor's daughter. Let's take a listen to that segment. This is Poetry as Witness. My momsy is 75, but for most of our lives together, my mother was a stranger to me. She's a residential school survivor, a secret she carried with her till 10 years ago. My name is Edna Ferguson. I was born South Indian Lake. My mother was born in 1945. She was raised in the north, on the land with her parents and sisters. But that would all be taken away from her. She spent most of her childhood in three different residential schools. 
after her dad died on the trap line and her mom died after getting sick with TB. She was sent to her first school when she was just five years old. We went to the park. We had a haircut just like a bowl. They put the bowl on your head, took our clothes off, put them in the fire, and then they said, bend your head, cool oil in my head. Then we had a cold shower. I was only five years old. You don't, you didn't go to school to learn. All you learned was to be mean, I didn't learn nothing. I didn't know how to read. And when I talk great, they grab your hair and bang, bang on the floor. I was too young to, to fight for myself. My mother was forbidden to speak Cree, the only language that she knew. Instead, the children were forced to learn and speak only in English, French, and Latin. We never, I never talk in English because I never understand English. And the uh, nun said, I, I don't know what he was saying, but she banged my head on the wall. I think she wanted me to stand straight in the wall like this. I didn't understand English till I was seven years old. But her language was not the only thing my mother lost in residential school. There was no sense of safety, encouragement, or love. We used to go to class four times a day. In the morning, after dinner, supper, before we go to bed. Ten o'clock, the last class. We just sat down there, I didn't know what to do. So I asked the teacher, can you pronounce what you're saying? I don't hear. I just want to hear what you're saying. He said, stand in the corner. I was standing there for three hours till the class was over. Next time we went to class, listen to the teacher, what he's saying. And he came and hit me my hands, and she hit my head. I didn't understand why. Why me? I was scared till I was 14. After leaving residential school behind, my mother tried to leave the memories behind, too. She locked away her experience for decades. She went back home to South Indian Lake. Raised by an abusive grandmother, for her, school and home were the same. Eventually, she had six children, but only repeated the cycle she had learned at school. Marrying my stepfather, a non-Indigenous man who moved us all to a small mining town, far away from our family and community. We were forbidden to speak to each other in our own language. There was alcohol, there was abuse, and there was silence. My mother never told us that she loved us. She showed little physical affection and was quick to anger and depression. But she showed her love in other ways. She kept the house clean. She kept us clean. We were fed. She brushed and braided my hair every day in her bedroom while she hummed and sent me off to school with homemade lunches. It wasn't until high school that I learned my mother's secret. My Native Studies teacher was a Native guy. On the first day, he took attendance and stopped at my name. He looked up at me and said, I know your mother. We went to residential school together. And I had no idea what he was talking about. So I went home and asked her, and it did not go well. I keep everything to myself. I didn't want to talk about it. I thought people would laugh at me or they'll say, oh, don't make up a story. That's what they used to say when we went home after school. They didn't believe what happened at school, what the nuns were doing. 
what the priests were doing. It took 20 more years before my mother shared her story with me. I was 37 years old. She was 65. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission was traveling across Canada collecting the stories of survivors. When they set up in Winnipeg, I took a chance. I asked her to come with me just to see what would happen, just to hear other survivors, to know that she wasn't alone. And to my utter amazement, she said yes. We spent half a day listening to survivors share their stories. Then she turned to me and said, Okay, my girl, I'm ready. I'm ready to talk about it. So I asked if my mother could join one of the sharing circles, but I was told there was no room for her that day to come back tomorrow. And that's when I decided that she wouldn't wait one more day to tell her story. I told her that I would listen to her, that I would tell her story, and that she would never have to be quiet ever again. When my daughter asked me the first time, when I write the story about your life, and I said no. Second time, I said no. Third time, I opened up. Our journey together would take five years. Five years of hesitant and careful conversations. Each story of her life in residential school was like a break in our bones. Shards of a broken story that we put back together. A slow healing that took the shape of a book of poetry. A book we named Calling Down the Sky. I told her to start off writing my story. Take it out of me. I'm feeling better every day when I talk about it. Yeah. I feel lighter when I talk about my life. It was so hard. That's how my life was. The more I heard of my mother's story, the more I understood her, and the more of a person she became. Yes, she has flaws and failings, but she's also really funny and silly, brave and strong. My mother is no longer a stranger to me. In fact, two years ago, she moved in with us. Every day we have coffee in the morning before I go to work. She makes us bannock and fries up moose meat. My girls love living with their grandma. And best of all, every day she says, I love you. This is Unreserved on CBC Radio 1, Sirius XM 169, and Native Voice 1. I'm Phelan Johnson, your host for this season of Unreserved. I'm with Rosanna Deerchild, who's my guest on the show today, sharing some of her favorite memories of the last six seasons. Now, Rosanna, I've often heard people say that you should never meet your heroes. But after six seasons of doing this show, you've met a lot of them. So who was the most nerve-wracking celebrity interview? Yeah, I met a lot of them from, oh, gosh, let's see. There's been Thomas King, Thompson Highway, I mentioned Buffy earlier, Cindy Blackstock. Like, so many people that have personal heroes to me. I've been so lucky that they've, you know, invited us in to share so much of their of their lives. But I'd have to say um, one of the most nerve-wracking celebrity interviews that I've ever had was with the great, the legendary, the... The beginning of it all, Alanisa Bomswin. Of course, she is the legendary filmmaker. She's made like, I don't know, 60 films or something, which is extraordinary in itself. So to meet her was insane. <laughs> like, even just being in the same room with Alanisa Bomswin, for me, it was like, uh, uh, uh. okay, speak, Rosanna, let sound come out. So um, we got to meet her on a blustery day in Montreal in the uh, NFB offices. And she had been in that, in that office for some time because there was like books everywhere and film and film canisters and awards and posters and, you know, little pieces of paper everywhere. It was, you know, it was, it was a very lived in, loved office. Um, but I was nervous. And so I was really sweaty and, and kind of, you know, 
shaky and like, oh my gosh, any minute now she's going to come walking through this door. Hello, Alanie. So wonderful to see you again. Oh my God. Ah. <laughs> so you're in my. Uh, I'm in your space. My space. Marveling at all the wonders in here. Well, my office looks like uh, my house. <laughs> <laughs> I've been uh, working here all these years. And um, I uh, keep things, you know. I, one time somebody threw some of my stuff in the garbage and I went to pick it up in the garbage and brought it back in here. <laughs> I'm glad they can't see the mess. <laughs> <laughs> it's the mess of a busy person, I would say. Uh, I don't loaf. <laughs> Let's talk about when you started making film and the discovery of film and the love for film. When did you discover film and why do you love it so much? It wasn't not my idea. I, I was singing mostly at the time and uh, talking to children in the classroom all over the country. I was uh, doing a lot of tours mainly because I was revolting against this, the educational system, especially concerning the history of this country. Mm-hmm. And uh, this this was my reason. That's how I started to work mm-hmm. in education. Mm-hmm. And uh, in 1960, 61, I guess, 62, I was campaigning to um, build a swimming pool on my reserve. Someone uh, made a film about what I was doing. And from there, uh, some people at the film board saw it and invited me to come here. And they said, tell us stories like you do in the classroom. So it was easy. Did you realize or understand that you were probably one of the only Indigenous filmmakers in Canada? Yeah. And how did you feel about being one of the very few Indigenous storytellers telling stories in this way? It was a very difficult time because, first of all, you have to think at that time it was really a man's world. There was not many women, period, making films. I was at the bottom of the line, really. (laughs) Since then, there's been so much change. And I think there's an ear from all Canadians to really listen to, to us. That was filmmaker Alanis Obobsowin in conversation with Rosanna Deerchild at the NFB offices in Montreal. So, Rosanna, I have another message to share with you. Let's take a listen. Hello, Rosanna. This is Elanise. I'm calling from my house in Montreal. I hear you are moving on to another very interesting project. I wish you lots of luck. I guess they're going to miss you where you are now. But uh, it'll be interesting, Just not just for you, but for all of us. We'll be watching. Have a wonderful time, Elanise. Bye. Okay, now I'm crying, you guys. That's That was not cool. <laughs> <laughs> wow. wow. So that was obviously the one and the only Alanis Obobsowin. That is wonderful. Thank you so much. I just, I can tell you how touched I am by hearing these messages. It's just, wow. Thank you. You should really revel in this because if we were allowed to be out in the world, you would be lauded and celebrated, you know, in a in a public place and we would all have a chance to raise a glass to you. But because we're in this, you know, pandemic situation, I'm just glad that we got to bring these offerings to you so that you could hear and get to feel a sense of your impact, you know, for so many people in Indian country and beyond. So congratulations. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm really touched. Thank you. I'm Phelan Johnson here with Rosanna Deerchild, watching her maybe shed a tear or two as we listen to some of her favorite moments from the last six years on the show. And before she heads off for her new project, a podcast with CBC Books, we wanted to get some more of her reflections. Rosanna, one thing the show did a lot before the pandemic and the lockdown began was travel. You went to different cities and communities across the country. And so what were some of your memorable trips, some of your favorite moments? Yeah, we have been everywhere in Kaluit, uh, 
as far west as Haida Gwaii, where everything about that place was unforgettable. Um, we've been to Halifax, uh, Victoria, Six Nations, as you mentioned earlier. Uh, so we've covered a lot of territory. We've covered a lot of stories. You know, we've been welcomed by many nations and honored to to be allowed to tell those stories. Um, but one really memorable moment for me wasn't that far from home, which is Winnipeg currently. Uh, we hopped in a CBC van and headed to Sandy Bay, Ojibwe First Nation, for their annual powwow. And I told you earlier how much I love going to powwows, the smells, the sounds, the, you know, just uh, the camping, all of it is just, it's just a beautiful experience. And so to me, this was sort of like going home, you know, um, and that's where I, I got to fulfill for me, my lifelong ambition. <laughs> my name is Michael Esquash Sr., and I'm originally from Swan Lake First Nation. And who's this old guy? This is my son. Lane. Lane. Simply Lane, like Cher or Lane. Prince. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> now, Michael, I'm pretty, I'm pretty comfortable with the microphone, as you can clearly see. Yep. But it has been my lifelong dream to be a powwow MC, Can you give me some tips, top four tips to be a good MC? Confidence, clear voice, mm -hmm. and just give her. Just give her. That's just three. What's the her. last? Is it secret? I don't, and the secret, <laughs> there's no secret to it. Just, <laughs> just enjoying talking, you know, enjoying yourself and, and, and be be happy is what you do, right? I mean, for me, I, I enjoy MCing because I get to try and get people hyped up and livened up and have a good time. You know, there's serious moments and then there's happy moments. There's a lot of fun involved when you MC a powwow, but you're trying to keep the momentum going and make sure that everybody knows what's happening. That's what it's about. I feel really ready. Can I? Can I? Can I do a little MC? Well, you're gonna. You can come up there with me. And I'm so nervous right, right now. Right. Come on, let's do this. Let's go then. Yeah, let's go <laughs> then. So as soon as they're done with special, I'll call you up there okay. and I'll introduce you, and then we'll we'll get you right in there. So as soon as they're done this, we'll call you right up. Give us one moment. I'm not nervous. Getting my MC groove on. I'm going to MC. I'm so nervous. <laughs> and we have the CBC crew here. Woo! All right. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce MC Rosanna Deerchild. So what you're saying is we're going to go down to Ojibwe Laws for our intertribal hookah. Oh, Nice and loud. We're going to go to Ojibwe Outlaws for the travel. Woo! Sandy Bay. Oh, my God. I can't believe I just did that. Did you see that? Yeah. 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 <laughs> so there you have it. Me realizing my lifelong dream of emceeing at a powwow as you know there's not many women emcees and and for me i was like yes finally i've reached the top of the tp <laughs> and uh so it was very exciting perhaps it'll be my next career <laughs> <laughs> this is unreserved on cbc radio one sirius xm 169 and native voice one I'm Rosanna Deerchild, here for the last time with you on the show. I'm heading off to work on a new project with CBC Books this season. But I'm leaving you in the very capable hands of Phelan Johnson, who's already made me cry three times today. <laughs> I promise I won't make listeners cry so much. <laughs> so one thing I really love about the show is all the laughter. We hear it just about every week. Lots and lots of laughter from you, from the guests. And so I'm going to put you on the spot and I'm going to ask you about the most fun show that you've ever recorded. Uh, you know, one that still makes you laugh when you hear it. There has been a lot of laughter, as you say. I'm one of the most fun um, remotes, we call them, that I've had was, was at Portage Place Mall in Winnipeg, which many Indigenous people here affectionately call Portage Place First Nation. Of course, because, you know, lots of nations meet there. It's sort of the meeting place. We go for coffee and stuff. So we did a show from there for Valentine's Day. It was called Let's Talk About Sex. Mm -hmm. um, and we had so much fun doing a, a little interview hits from there and talking to people about sex and love and dating advice. We had Duncan McHugh, a.k.a. Duncan McCuty, doing our IDs. And it was just a lot of fun. So this is this is some of, of that. 
There's some good-looking young men over here I'm going to go harass. Hopefully they say yes, talking to me. <laughs> hey, guys, don't turn me down. My self-esteem is taking a big hit today. What's your name? Stacy. Stacy? Hello, Stacy. What's your name? Farah. So I take it you guys are a couple. Yes, we are for four years now. Wonderful, wonderful. And four how did you meet? Uh, we met we met here actually at first place uh, in the food court. Well, the first day I didn't I didn't talk to her. Then she approached me the second day, and then we just took it from there and we stayed with each other ever since. When I first saw her, I, I couldn't I couldn't I couldn't look at her, so I just put my head down and I was talking to my two nephews that I was pushing at the moment. Like I was like I was shocked, said, and then I was shocked even the second day when she came and approached me, and we just hit it off from there, I guess. Yeah. Farah, what made you want to talk to this this young man over yeah, here? What I was attracted to, to, to him. him. He was cute. I just got out of jail. I was in jail for six months. Uh, he helped me straighten out my life and get my kids out of CFS. Your yeah. son, not your kids. Yeah, well, my son, and then yeah. That's so lovely. I love love stories. No, right? I notice you uh, like the hickeys. Oh uh, yeah, <laughs> we're engaged that way. <laughs> what is it with hickeys and indigenous people? Why do you why'd you give him a hickey? I don't know. It's just normal. I part don't know. It's of, just I know, part of the love making, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> what is it about you like about the uh, hickeys? Let's other 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 Indians know that you're tooken. <laughs> you're tooken. Keep them away. <laughs> yeah. Keep them away. Sometimes it doesn't work. Noted. <laughs> I laughed so hard I knocked down part of my blanket for it. <laughs> it tells people you're tookin. It tells people you're tookin. <laughs> so that was one of Rosanna Deerchild's most memorable moments from hosting Unreserved for the last six years, chatting about dating with strangers at Portage Place Mall. Yes. So, Rosanna, you will, of course, be back when there's the launch date of your podcast, when that all comes a bit closer. But in the meantime, are there any final words of wisdom for me as incoming host of the show? Ooh, that's such a big, big question. Well, I'm sure you're going to be amazing anyway. You have the curiosity. You have the talent, um, you know, and you have that uh, that hunger to, to tell Indigenous story. So that is, of course, the best kind of start you can have. But I would also... Um, tell tell you to listen you know listen to your guests listen to your audience listen to your community uh listen to your producers you don't want a, you don't want a mad producer it's the last thing you want <laughs> um so so listen is is my number one rule and then you know secondly be present just just be present in the moment like how many times are you going to meet your heroes the first time how many times are you going to be in that community? How many times are you going to be a, to have an opportunity to tell that story? So just be present and know that that's a gift. That's why it's called present. <laughs> yeah, that's a really good way of remembering it. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Is to, and you need to give it away. Um, third, I would say always be humble. You know, never consider yourself above other people or, or other guests or, you know, anybody. You're, you're there you're there to tell story and know that that you are there for the people you're not there for a corporation you're not there for a job you're not there for anything but to to share that space with the people and that's really sacred and really important and finally when in doubt go back to rule number one listen that's some very sage advice rosanna thank you you're welcome so before I let you head back to the podcast, Rosanna, I have one final message to share with you. Let's see who it's from. Hi, Sheila Rogers from the next chapter. Ro, I'll never forget meeting you at the Manitoba Book Awards back in 2009 when you won the Poetry Prize for This is a Small Northern Town, and your name was announced, and you took to the stage in red shoes with five-inch heels, and you just owned it. I've always loved how you live up to the title of the program. And specifically, I remember the episode that you hosted from the Megaphono Festival in Ottawa, and you were sitting in between two Indigenous trailblazers, Alanisa Bomsawin and Dr. Duke Redbird. And then they were talking about how they sang and danced their way to making changes in the journey to tell Indigenous stories. They teased each other. They were flirting with each other. She called him the old man. He called her my grandmother over there. 
you caught the love between Duke and Alanis, and you said, do I need to move out of the way here? Perfect. Just perfect and so funny. I'll also never forget your compassion when you interviewed me about Richard Wagamese not long after he died. You allowed for, for, for my sorrow, you allowed for my silence, and you really saved me. You're always so in the moment. There hasn't been an episode of Unreserved when I haven't learned something about listening or hosting from you. I love your voice, whether it's poetry, national radio, or like now, podcasting. And I know 150 years is going to be amazing because you are. Welcome to CBC Books, dear Nisi. We're thrilled out of our heads to have you with us. Much love from Auntie Shishi. Ah, uh, Auntie Shishi, she's the best. She's been such a guide for me, you know. She's been such an amazing guide for me and an inspiration, and it was just an honor to know her. To breathe the same broadcast air as Sheila Rogers. <laughs> It's pretty amazing. She she really echoed a lot of the advice that you've just given me, which I think is is quite nice. Yeah. Very serendipitous. So obviously that was Sheila Rogers. And uh, and from all of us at Unreserved Now, Rosanna, we wish and we wish you well. And we can't wait for you to come back and tell us more about the podcast before it launches. Well, thank you for having me, Phil. And I hand over the glittery mic for you. All the best to you, Phil. And Thank you, Rosanna. That's it for this week's episode of Unreserved. Unreserved is produced by Zoe Tennant, Kyle Muzika, Stephanie Cram, and Anna Lazowski. I'm Phelan Johnson. Thanks, and Nyawagoa for listening. For more CBC Podcasts, go to cbc.ca slash podcasts.